Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about superstring amplitudes in genus 0 and 1. Um, I'm actually going to say very little uh, actual string theory, actual physics, because I figure that you probably understand this better than I do. Um, and if not, then the mathematics will be self-contained anyway. So first of all, an overview of what I plan to say before actually saying it. Um, so my understanding in, in superstring perturbation theory is that there are in fact two uh, perturbations. The first is an expansion according to the genus. Um, so the world, sheet, mod, the world sheet will be a surface of genus G with N punctures. And um, there will be an expansion according to the genus. And there's a second expansion in a parameter alpha prime. Um, so in this talk, I will only consider the cases where the genus is 0 or 1, because those are the only cases that I feel I understand. Um, so approximately, the uh, objects we're interested in are integrals over a moduli space of curves, genus G, with n marked points, or its Deline Mumford complexification, of some uh, differential form, times the exponential of something which depends on alpha prime and Mandelstam variables Sij times a Green's function which depends on the differences between particle positions. This makes sense in genus 0 and 1. Um, so the strategy is the following um, <clears throat> for tackling these integrals. First, you want to think of the surface as being fixed and particles as moving around on this surface. And so you integrate over all possible particle positions. And having done that, you then integrate over the, uh, the modulus, the moduli of the surface. Okay, so there's a two-stage process. But in the case of genus zero, there is no moduli of a Riemann sphere. Um, it reduces to a point. So the last step will not be visible. Okay, so um, very classical uh, results due to Veneziano and, and Virasoro. So here we're on uh, the Riemann sphere, and we have four particles, um, so either on the Riemann sphere or on a disk in the first case. And these four particles have four momenta, um, and out of these momenta you define uh, Mandelstam uh, variables S, T, and U. So for example, S is just the momentum of particle one plus momentum of particle 2 squared. And it boils down to calculating just a beta function. So this is a, a, a beta function. And as we all know, this is a, a, a quotient of three gamma functions. Now, if you recall that the second stage is to now expand in the parameter alpha prime, which is very classical. And we find something rather interesting, very well known. So first of all, we find that there are poles in uh, in S and T. So it's not a Taylor expansion, it's a Laurent expansion. And we find that the exponential of a quantity which involves all values of the Riemann theta function, at all positive integers greater than or equal to T. Now, much less well known to mathematicians, at least, is the following um, closed string amplitude, which is a kind of complex beta. So it's the same integral as before, except we replace every x and 1 minus x with their absolute value squared. And now we integrate over the whole, all the complex points of the complexified moduli space. So in this case, the whole of the Riemann sphere. And so that it's a two-dimensional integral now. And somewhat uh, extraordinarily, the answer is still a, involves now six gamma functions. And this is rather interesting because you can get this from the previous answer, at least formally, at least two different ways. The first way is to take this uh, function and divide it by the same function in which you replace gamma of x with gamma of 1 minus x. That gives you this. So that's not a physics prescription, a KLP prescription I'll give in a minute. Another way to do it, which is perhaps less elegant, is to square this quantity and multiply by some signs in S and T, and S plus T, and you can, you can conjure this up by, by taking the square of this quantity. 
Now, if we expand in alpha prime again, we find, again, something extraordinary, that the answer is, in fact, identical to the previous integral, with the only difference that all the terms corresponding to the even zeta values have disappeared, and all the terms involving an odd zeta value get multiplied by two. And this is the phenomenon that I want to explain today. Okay, so more generally, what do the, the open and closed amplitudes look like in genus zero? We have n plus three points on a, on a Riemann sphere. And by the action of PSL3C, we can always place three of these particles at zero, one, and infinity. Now, given any permutation of um, n plus three letters, we can uh, write z subscript pi to be the product of the successive differences. Okay? So if you, one of these is, is infinite, if you don't like it, you can just omit, if you like, all the terms involving um, the point quantity infinity. Just delete those terms from the product. Won't make any difference. So with that definition, the open um, substring amplitudes are approximately of the following shape. They're an integral of a, a, a holomorphic n form, dz1 up to dzn, divided by this quantity here, times the product of the differences zi minus zj to the alpha prime times the Mandelstam invariant. And the domain of integration is uh, the ordered simplex where z1 is less than up to zn less than 1. Okay, so that's a generalization of the beta function. Closed amplitudes, likewise, um, are complex integrals now. So this time you take the same, essentially the same integrand as before, and you wedge it, you take its exterior product with exactly the same volume form for a different permutation, and you take its complex permutation. So this integral is now uh, twice the dimension of the previous integral. And it's really two copies of this integrand. So if you take this integrand and another one like it, take its complex conjugate and wedge them together, you get exactly this, because the absolute value of zi minus zj squared is exactly zi minus zj times zi bar minus zj bar. Okay, now the integral is over the whole complexified moduli space. It didn't fit on a slide, but this weekend. Okay, so um, a very famous result um, that I've been hearing a lot about recently um, in the context of, of double copy construction are the so-called KLT forms. And this is why I recently started to try to understand this form now. So what it gives is, is a, a general way to express the closed amplitude in terms of the open amplitude. Um, in the literature, the, the formula appears slightly differently, but this is just a, 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 an approximation. Um, but the rough idea is that the closed amplitude is a quadratic expression the open amplitude. So you sum over all possible pairs of permutations, multiply these open integrals together, and there's some correction factor that involves signs of the Mandelstam invariant, SIG. And so what I want you to retain from this is just the, the following simple slogan, that this formula tells you that if you compute the closed amplitude, if we would go back, so the closed amplitude means take this differential form and take another one like it, complex conjugate, multiply them together, and then integrate. That's the same thing as integrating the differential form uh, here and then multiplying them together. So the slogan I want to recall is that KLT tells you how to multiply then integrate, and it says that it's the same thing as integrating and then multiplying. And we shall see that there, this, in fact, has nothing to do with physics. Well, it has a lot to do with physics. But it's actually a very, very special case of an extremely general result in mathematics. And this is very surprising because we know that integration and multiplication absolutely do not commute. OK, so I'm going to talk about the mathematics behind all of this. Um, I couldn't resist saying the words cosmic Galois group. This is a phrase invented by Cartier. The result of this talk gives some yet more very strong evidence that there is a huge group of symmetries acting on amplitudes. 
Um, I would have loved to talk about this, but it's technical and I don't have time. Then in the last part of the talk, I will turn to genus one and explain how uh, genus one closed string amplitudes are related to a completely new theory of uh, modular forms. Okay, so now that the talk begins proper, um, and I'm going to talk about a, a, um, a notion of integration that I call single value constriction. Okay, so um, in the usual theory of integration, what we do is we take a differential form, omega, and we integrate it over a domain of integration, sigma. And that gives us a number, or if it depends on parameters, it can give us functions. So we can think of integration as a rule which allows us to couple forms with domains together. So what I want to talk about is a way to integrate, to couple differential forms with other differential forms. And more precisely, a way to integrate a differential form over the dual of a differential form. So this is uh, what I'd like to call single valued integration. And um, to denote it, I made up this funny symbol, an integral with an S on it. Um, so it's never occurred before anywhere. I make it because that is a pretty horrible symbol. And this is going to give typically a real number. So mathematically, this can be thought of as, in fact, a p-adic period, um, a certain kind of p-adic period, at the infinite time p. So before explaining what this um, theory of integration is, I'm going to give you some examples. And the, the, the most familiar example of a single valued function is the logarithm. So the logarithm is, uh, can be written as an integral of dx over x from the point 1 to the point z in the complex plane. Now, of course, that that's uh, ill-defined. I didn't say how to integrate from 1 to z. It depends on the choice of path. And as we all know, if you, if you move this path very slightly, it doesn't affect the value of the integral. But if you move the path a lot and wind around the origin in a complicated way, then the answer changes, and the logarithm gets modified by some integer multiple of 2 pi i. Now, the Wonderful thing is that 2 pi i times an integer is always an imaginary number. So that means we can do the following thing. We can take the real part of the logarithm, and that does not depend on the choice of path of integration. In other words, the logarithm of z is a multi-valued function, but the real part of the logarithm is single-valued, is well -defined. And in fact, for reasons we'll see later, it's better to take twice the real part, which is nothing other than the log of the absolute value of z squared. Okay, so more a more interesting example is the dilogarithm. It goes back to Leibniz, which is also a multi-valued function on now on the, the complex plane minus zero and one. And in the neighborhood of the origin, it's defined by this um, absolutely convergent series. And it extends by analytic continuation to a multi-valued function on the whole of C minus 0 and 1. And it also has an integral expression, which I didn't write down. Um, and you can make this single valued. Uh, this was done very famously by Bloch and Wigner uh, quite a long time ago. And you do this now not by taking the real part, but by taking the imaginary part of this function. And then you need to correct it with uh, the log of the absolute value of z times log of 1 minus z, and take its imaginary part. Now, this modified function uh, is brilliant because it no longer has any monodromy. It is completely single valued, and we think of it as a single valued version of the classical dialogue. Okay, so it's very clear what I mean by a single valued function, a multi valued function. Now I want to talk about multi-valued, single-valued numbers. Okay, so that's a slightly strange concept. But the numbers that are relevant in uh, genus zero string perturbation theory are very old. They're called multiple zeta values. And
and they go back to the 1770s. They were defined by Euler. So for any um, tuple of R uh, positive integers, where the last integer is greater than or equal to 2, you can consider this nested sum converges, and it defines a number. And these numbers clearly generalize the values of the Riemann zeta function at positive integers greater than equal to 2. Um, now, now, these numbers satisfy a lot of uh, very complicated um, algebraic relations, um, which are intensively studied here in Japan, many, many people. Um, we do not fully understand them. Okay, so there's a number. So I, I was told uh, as a student that a, a constant is just a function that is having a rest, it's taking a break. So what are the functions associated to these numbers? Well, one way to, to, to turn these numbers into functions is to put a little z to the nr in the numerator. And we consider these nested sums. These define functions called multiple polylogarithms that also go back at least 100 years. So they were used by Lapid and Elevich to solve human health problems in the university case. Um, these authors are actually not very often cited in this context. These are very, very classic objects. So they are multi valued functions on C minus 0, 1. And of course, they generalize the guide operation and the log. So, um, from a physics perspective, they are important because they are the coefficients of the solution to the universal kinetic zamological equation. Um, from a modern perspective, they are the simplest example of Chen's theory of integrated energy. So, something I did in my, my master's thesis was to do what Bloch and Wigner did to the guy logarithm and do it to these functions. Um, and it turns out you can take uh, linear combinations of products by taking real and imaginary parts and define a canonical single valued version, curly L, associated to every multiple polylogarithm. So it is a canonical, and you can do it in such a way that they preserve all the algebraic relations satisfied by these functions, and they preserve all the differential equations with respect to the holomorphic. These combinations are quite complicated. So now what we can do is define single valued versions of multiple zeta values to be the values of one of these single valued functions. So remember that the multiple zeta values were the values of one of these holomorphic multiple polylogarithms. The single valued multiple zeta values are the values of one of their single valued versions. And I'm told in Japanese that multiple zeta value is actually multi-value zeta value. So that would mean that these are single-value, multi-value zeta values. And I take full blame for this horrible choice of um, uh, name for these numbers in part of my thesis. Okay, so the simplest example of this is the dialogarithm. So if we evaluate the dialogarithm of one, you remember the dialogarithm was the imaginary part of the dialogue. So the block Wigner dialogue, the imaginary part. But the uh, imaginary part of something real always vanishes. So the single valued version of zeta 2 vanishes. This should start ringing some bells. And in fact, you can show that the, the even, the single valued even zeta values all vanish, and the odd zeta values in their single valued version get multiplied by 2. This was exactly the recipe to pass from the classical zeta function to the complex zeta function. The closed amplitude, sorry, from the open amplitude to the closed amplitude. So continuing, we find actually that zeta phi 3 is interesting because it's the first multiple zeta value that we expect to be algebraically independent from all values of the Riemann zeta function. But here we find uh, in the single valued world there's a relation. There are more relations satisfied by but in fact, uh, the first non-trivial single-valued multiple zeta value occurs at weight 11, and it's this combination here. So uh, very surprisingly, um, the single-valued multiple zeta values satisfy all the known and expected relations that the multiple zeta values hold. Satisfy. So this is very surprising because we took the multiple zeta values, which satisfy lots of equations, we replaced them with functions which absolutely do not satisfy those equations. 
we made them single value, and then evaluated at y. There's no reason whatsoever that the equations we started off with should still remain true, but they do. And because of that, um, this, this is quite slightly inaccurate, but I'll go with it. There's a way to make sense of this formula. But it means that because the single value multiple of each of values satisfy all the same equations as the ordinary multiple of each value, we can map a zeta value to its single value vertex. This is called the single value projection. So this, this has a rigorous, this is meaningless for everything here, but there is a sense in which it's absolutely worthwhile. And the warning is, because this is used a lot um, in the physics literature, this does not, this whole theory I've mentioned is going to exist in complete generality for all periods. Period. But this projection does not exist in general. It's, it requires some special features of the logic. Okay, so a theorem which is we've been floating around for a long time is that, in fact, if you take the open superstring amplitude from genus zero, then you can, they have a, a Lahar expansion in the Mandelstam variables, and the numbers, the coefficients of these, are multiple zeta values. So I, I, I haven't in any way given a complete list of people who have worked on this. I apologize for that. Um, it follows in part from uh, once you've extracted, the, the, made the, the integrals convergent, finite, and I'll explain how to do that, then you can um, you can use my proof of a conjecture of Gonshaw and Manning, which I did in my thesis. There's related work in the paper, which goes in a similar direction. Okay, so the multiple zeta values weren't introduced by accident because they're the coefficients in genus zero. So very recently, um, Stieberger and, and another paper by Stieberger and Taylor conjectured that the, in general, if you want to get a closed superstring amplitude, you don't need to compute any integrals at all. Remember that these, these tricky dz, dz bar integrals that we, we, we find hard. You can simply take the open corresponding open amplitude and just hit it with a single value projection. And that gives the same answer. So it means you expand in the SIJ and apply the single value projection term by term. And that's a, a different way to get from open to closed. And that's a theorem, so it's something uh, work in progress with Clemente. So to explain this, let me um, cast the net much more broadly and speak about something much more general. So now I want to consider, um, given any smooth algebraic variety over Q, it's a, 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 a um, collection of polynomials and many variables with rational coefficients, and their zeros will define the smooth manifold. Then we can consider a, a period on this is an integral of some differential form, which is uh, supposed to be algebraic and have rational coefficients. And the domain of integration will be a chain on, on the complex points of this, this manifold whose boundary is algebraic. So the boundary of this chain of integration is contained, uh, is defined by algebraic uh, equations over Q. That's a general definition of a period integral. And so we can interpret this as follows. In, in fact, by Stokes' theorem, such an integral only depends on the cohomology class of the differential form, omega, in something called relative algebraic Durand cohomology. And the, likewise, you can change the domain of integration, um, again by Stokes' formula, and we interpret the domain of integration as a, as a homology class. But because it has a, a non-trivial boundary, it's in the homology of x modulo t, which is where it's bound by. So this is relative homology. And the dual of homology is cohomology. So this is the dual of Betty, what's called Betty or singular cohomology. So we have two different cohomology theories, Durand cohomology, defined out of differential forms, and Betty cohomology, defined out of cochains. And Grotendieck tells us that we should think of integration as a way to pair differential forms and cycles, in other words, the RAM cohomology classes with Betty homology classes. In fact, it's 
time is perfect. So you can take this Hn and put it on the other side of the equation by taking the Q. And integration can be interpreted as a canonical isomorphism between Durand cohomology and vector filters. And you have the tensor with C here because when you integrate, you get transcendental numbers of terms. Okay, so that's how we think about integration. Now, um, on any such um, algebraic variety, we can if we take its complex points, that's a complex, complex solutions to our equation, that's a manifold, and we can apply complex conjugation. And complex conjugation is very nice because it's continuous. So it defines a continuous map from the manifold to itself and from the divisor D to itself. And on um, homology, cohomology, singular cohomology, it induces a continuous map, induces a, a map, which is called the real Frobenius. Okay, it's just complex conjugation. And this is an involution. So what we can do now, so there is no analog in, in cohomology of complex conjugation. If you take an algebraic differential form, dx over x, and you complex conjugate it, nothing happens. There is no notion of complex conjugation on algebraic differential forms. But instead, what we can do is take differential forms, but integration, rewrite them as some transcendental linear combinations of chains of integration. We can complex conjugate those, and then we can write them back as differential forms. Okay, so we go from Durand cohomology to Betti cohomology, complex conjugate, and we go back to the round problem. And this is some, so the best approximation that we can get to complex conjugation in the round world. So what you get is a map from the round cohomology to itself, which is an isomorphism. And it turns out that you only need to tensor with the real numbers and not the complex numbers. So here we've got a, a very a highly transcendental map from differential forms to differential forms. So this gives us a way to integrate differential forms against differential forms. So if we start off with a cohomology class in Durand cohomology and a dual cohomology class mu, then what we can do, going back to this, we start off with our class omega, we send it over here, pop, 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 over to here, and then mu is an element of the dual vector space that gives us a map into C. So that what I just said was to, to compare these two, a differential form and a dual differential form, we apply this SV map to the first differential form and then hit it with a dual. And I write this as the single value integral of omega against mu. And that defines a real number. Now this gives us a notion of integration that satisfies all the usual rules. By linear in the, in the arguments, it satisfies changes. It, it, well, satisfies a kind of a change of variables formula with respect to algebraic changes of variables. Now the problem is, uh, with this is that we, we are very unfamiliar with duals of differential forms. We don't really know what they look like or, or have much intuition for them. But there's a way to get around this using duality. So now I'm going to make it much more specific and look at um, a case where x is a smooth projective variety of dimension n and A and B are normal crossing devices. And then uh, Poincaré and Verdier explain that the dual of the cohomology of X minus A relative to B is the cohomology in a different degree of X minus B relative to A. So we flip the roles of A and B, and there's a tape twist here, which is just a, a factor of two pi i. And so using this, we can think of a dual form on this vector space as an actual differential form. So in this particular case, then what we can do is just take any differential form on a smooth projective variety uh, of, of the same degree as its dimension with logarithmic singularity along some divisor. Same, uh, another one with logarithmic singularities along a different divisor. Then in this case, you have a formula for the single value integral. It's simply the integral of the, the complex point of your variety of omega wedge mu bar. That's exactly the type of dz, dz bar integrals that uh, we were formerly scared of. Now we know that that's just a single value. 
And there's a very subtle point here. The, the left-hand side is always well-defined. And the right-hand side, on the other hand, has a lot of issues. So to prove this, you have to intrinsically use the partitions of unity and some tubular neighborhood argument. It works because in the case where we have logarithmic singularities, this integral happens to be the Bayes integral. In general, it's not. It's ill-defined. And some recent papers by Kajdan and Felder have addressed this problem in the very special case where you, your, your divide is smooth. You only have one irreducible root term. In general, I'm, it's, it's not clear what to do with these things, and there's some very subtle issues with this. So, uh, in fact, the corollary of the previous theorem, that if in the same setting, you can write the single valued integral as an omega wedge mu bar integral, but you can also write it as a quadratic expression in ordinary integrals. Integrate omega over sigma, mu over tau bar, where sigma and tau are bases of relative homologies, and then you have the duality gives you a pairing between the two homology bases, so you get this general formula that holds in, in, in extreme generality. So this should remind you of the KLT slogan. On the left-hand side, we multiply two differential forms together, omega and mu bar, and then we integrate. And that's the same thing as integrating omega, integrating mu, and then multiplying. So that's exactly what was going on in this KLT theorem. But it's got nothing to do with string theory. It's a completely general statement. So here's an example. We take the logarithm. Um, and it's a period of this relative cohomology. So let me write it. Uh, it it's a single version, a single value version is log absolute value squared. And the two theorems give us two different ways to compute that. One is a dz dz bar integral over the Riemann sphere, here it is. And the other way is as a quadratic expression in ordinary integrals. And it's, it's quadratic because one of the integrals just gives one in this case. And we retrieve the fact that it's log x. Okay, so now to actually um, prove Stieberger's conjecture, we need to just apply this theory in a very, very special case, which is one example, the example of the moduli space of curve theories. Okay, so now let n bigger than be bigger than the panel equal to four. The moduli space m zero n is simply n tuples of distinct points in the Riemann sphere, modulo the action. So that action is very easy to describe. You can place three of the points at 0, 1, and infinity. And so M04 is just uh, the Riemann sphere minus three points. And here is a picture of M05. It's, in fact, M04 cross itself minus the diagonal. Um, I'm wondering if I'm doing fine. Um, I'm going to accelerate it a little bit. So, so um, it turns out that on the moduli space, there's some very natural coordinates, which I defined in my thesis, called dihedral coordinates. We actually saw them already this morning. Um, so if, if we now assume that our, our marked points on a sphere have a, a dihedral structure, so just since I have no means of drawing, just imagine them sort of being arranged in a circle. Okay? So we have these marked points arranged in a circle, and then if we cut this circle in two, so imagine in your mind a circle with points on it, cut in two, then on, on either side of that chord, we get two points up here that are next to each other, and two points down here that are next to each other. So it'll be i, i plus one, j, and j plus one. So then if we forget all the other points, we get a map to m04, and that gives us a coordinate function. So that's called a dihedral coordinate. And on m05, there are exactly five of and in the usual coordinate system, they're just two. So in this case, they happen to be cluster coordinates, which are very popular these days. In general, they are not cluster coordinates for n bigger than or equal to six. Okay, so these coordinates are very useful. They're, they're, they define um, they do all sorts of things. To cut the long story short, we can rewrite the open superstring amplitude using these coordinates very compactly. It's now an integral over the domain where all UCs are positive. You can, this less than one is redundant. It's just a domain where the UCs are all positive. 
and um, the integrand is just each dihedral coordinate raised to some parameter SC, which is a linear combination in Mandel's spectral variable, times some logarithmic differential quantity. So that's that's the form of an open superstring amplitude. And um, it turns out using these dihedral uh, coordinates, you can canonically renormalize a superstring amplitude in this very compact way. Um, so basically, it's a sum over all the ways of, of decomposing, cutting up an end gone, and an integral over products over moduli spaces of renormalized amplitudes. So in the physics literature, there's a lot of the algorithms for making these finite. Um, I think it's quite nice to have a, a completely closed formula. And this uses the fact that so the way you renormalize this is the same you can renormalize um, amplitudes in, in the subject quantum field theory by, by subtracting off poles with counter terms. And the point of this is that the, the, the magic of these dihedral coordinates is when you, when you subtract off a pole along some bounding divisor, you don't create another pole elsewhere. So um, same with the closed amplitudes. It, this is a completely geometric st statement about the geometry of moduli spaces. So without any work whatsoever, we also deduce that the closed amplitude also has a canonical renormalization. And this explains precisely what these poles in the Mandel stump variables are. So exactly the pole singularity. And then, having made the integrals finite, we can then apply the single value machine with a sneaky detour through the theory of motion, which the sequence has to be rigorously defined. But we find then that essentially these renormalized closed amplitudes are exactly the single value versions of the open integrals. And therefore, we prove that the, the single value projections of the open superstring amplitudes are indeed closed superstring amplitudes. And that proves uh, stability. Okay, what about KLT then? In fact, we can pick up KLT very easily from this formalism. But um, there's a caveat here, which is which is completely glossed over in the literature. Um, so up to now, we've been thinking of the Mandelstam variables as formal parameters and expanded. And we can also think of them as complex numbers. And that's a very different thing to do. It's not clear to me completely clear to me how to relate these two points. So when you do this, um, what we have on the open moduli space, we have a, a, a rank one connect, uh, algebra connector bundle, um, a locally free, in fact, globally free coherent sheaf. It has this connection, which is very familiar to physics, the delinization of the kinetic topological connection. The sections of this connection form a rank one local system, which is exactly what's called the Tobin-Nielsen factor. And again, this is something I didn't understand from the literature until, until I realized that, that you really want to look at this Duran cohomology with coefficients in two copies of this connection. So these are self-dual objects. And we can apply this single-valued machine not just to cohomology, but to cohomology with coefficients. So you apply it to this very specific example, an Alphot KLT formula. Um, so well, in fact, our pops a formula which involved intersection numbers. In fact, these are two different formulas. Um, one of them involves intersection numbers on the Betty side, and one involves intersection numbers on the Ram side. And we're very fortunate because these intersection numbers were computed by a very extensive school of Japanese mathematicians studying the hypergeometric function um, Cho, Yoshida, Kanamura, Keiji Matsumoto, uh, Mimachi, many others. And as Mizara has recently uh, pointed out that these intersection numbers are exactly the terms arising in the KLT equation. So the KLT pops out of this theory as well. Now finally I turn to genus 1. Um, so genus 1 less is understood. Okay, so now we're going to consider um, only closed string amplitudes. I'm not entirely sure what, what one is supposed to um, that it's not quite the same um, version of, of the story we had before. So I'm going to, only going to look at closed string amplitudes, and we're looking at integrals of this kind of shape, um, where the Green's functions here in these, these, depending on these differences between two particles, is something explicit. You can write it down. Um, it involves logarithms of theta functions, logarithms of absolute value. I didn't write it down. Either you know it. Um, or it's just a, a quite a complicated thing. 
And the strategy is, I already mentioned the strategy, that we can view M1N as a, as a uh, vibration over the moduli stack of a limited curve. And the fibers are the configuration spaces of points on the universal infinite curve. So the idea is to, to integrate in the fiber, uh, integrate out the positions of the particles on a fixed elliptic curve. And that gives you a number which actually depends on your elliptic curve. So then if you change the modulus at all of your elliptic curve, what you're getting is a function on the base M11. But the base, as an orbifold, is the orbifold quotient of the upper half plane by S of Dj. So what you're getting here is some modular invariant functions on the upper half plane. Okay, so the, what you're supposed to do is, is do the full integral on M1n, right? You get numbers, but we're gonna do it two stages. First integrate over a fixed elliptic curve and then and then allow the elliptic curve to move, you're going to get functions on the, the moduli, on the modulus form. It turns out that's a much more interesting thing to do than, than the full integral. So this strategy is due to, to Michael Green and uh, Rosso and Doka and Van Hover, the whole long sequence of people who have been working on this for many years now. So it turns out that first integral can be done completely done by these authors I mentioned. And what, to cut a very long story short, what you get is for any graph, you associate a modular invariant function, IG of tall. And so this satisfies the modular transformation property that it's invariant un under this metric. Okay, thank you. So here's, um, here's an example. Here's a, an example of a very sim simple graph with three external legs. Um, you can do this in general. There are sort of Feynman rules that associate to any graph some nested sum. So here it's the imaginary part of four cubed over um, a term corresponding to each uh, leg, each edge, m1 tor plus m1, m2 tor plus m2, m3 tor plus m3, but by momentum conservation, the momentum in edge three, say this one, is the sum of the momentum in edge one. So you get this restricted nested sum, and that's a modular function. So Zaghi, about 20 years ago, was the first person to study this, and by a heroic piece of uh, very complicated mathematics, managed to prove that it's a linear combination of zeta-3 and real analytic Eisenstein suite. And the question that's been around for about 20 years is, what is the class of functions that describes superstring amplitude? So they have the following properties, I'll just wind up here. Unlike holomorphic modular forms, which have a free expansion in Q towards the integer by I tor, they have a, an expansion in Q, Q bar and in tor. Zerbini has, has proven in some cases and conjectured that the coefficients are always single valued multiples of value. There are lots of algebraic identities satisfied, and there is a very complicated hierarchical structure to be satisfied with respect to the so very recently, I constructed a natural family, a new family of non-holomorphic modular forms which satisfy every single property on the last slide. And the great thing about the classical theory of modular forms, holomorphic modular forms, is that they are uniquely determined from the first few Fourier coefficients. You know the weight, and you know a couple of Fourier coefficients, you know the whole expansion. And the same is true in this theory. And the idea of the construction is the single valued machine. I say it by now. So you basically take a, a, an Eisenstein series and you do the analog of the block Wigner construction. You take the imaginary part of the double integral and you correct it in all sorts of ways. Um, this connects to all sorts of very deep and interesting questions in mathematics, mock modular forms, weak harmonic mass forms, Franklin subgroup method, universal mechanism, etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. So The conclusion then is that the KLT formula and this issue of closed versus open is part of a very general mathematical theory. It's an extremely special case of something much more general. There's a lot of interaction between string theory and number theory, a lot of interesting open questions. Finally, in genus zero and genus one, these period integrals actually turn out to be iterated integrals of one thing. And that means they're connected to the fundamental group. Now in higher genus, we can construct something uh, we can construct a, a canonical generalization of the kinetic terminological equation in 
water hub. And my question is, to you, is it the case that all superstring amplitudes are related to series of fundamental series in the same way that they are in genus 0 and 1? If they are, then we have basically finished because um, something called the two tower principle goes back a long, a long way, stated in a different context by Crosby, tells you that once you know genus 0 and genus 1, in fact, you know everything. Because in terms of the fundamental group, genus 0 and genus 1 generate 